All right, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Megan Litweiler, and I am the program manager for Advanced Learning Initiatives at the Irving Institute for Energy and Society at Dartmouth College. And I am delighted to welcome you to this session of our series, New Energy Conversations with Early Career Researchers. Now, this new energy series began about two years ago to give early career energy scholars from around the country and around the world a platform to share their research and as a way that um, we can all learn about emerging topics in energy and society. And new energy has also become kind of a community for early career scholars to connect and network and collaborate. And we're really excited about where this initiative is heading. And we're thrilled that you're joining us here today. And we'll have a chance for you all to ask some questions at the end of today's talk. So please feel free to enter those using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I will introduce Vivian, our speaker, in just a moment. But first, we are delighted to have Dr. Sarah Kelly here to moderate this session. Sarah is a geographer who specializes in interdisciplinary and applied research on energy and water equity. Her work is based in northern New England, ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, and southern Chile, ancestral Mapuche Wiliche territory. And she is trained as a community-based participatory researcher. Sarah is a research associate at the Irving Institute for Energy and Society and a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Geography at Dartmouth. And she is the Director of Practice at the Energy Justice Clinic. And together with um, colleague Dr. Marin Greenleaf, they recently won Dartmouth's Afgar Teaching Award. Her work has been published in Energy Policy, Energy Research and Social Sciences, and Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews, among other journals. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Kelly. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, it's my honor to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Vivian Ogechi Nwadiru received her bachelor's in metallurgic and materials engineering and an MS in energy engineering. Before joining UMass Amherst as a PhD student, she completed an international climate protection research fellowship funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation at the Technical University of, Ber of Berlin and the University of Oxford, investigating Nigeria's energy transition and proliferation of fossil fuel backup generators. Her research with Elevate explores equitable demand response strategies, such as pricing schemes for deploying solar and storage technologies to reduce cost and improve reliability in low-income communities. Thanks so much for joining us. Vivian, we listen to listening to your talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I'm just going to start my presentation and take it right up from there. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. Um, I, I hear we have a, a full house and I'll just dive right into my talk. So the presentation, what I'm what this presentation is basically um, still really at the ideation phase and we we've been thinking about how storage can be leveraged in low income communities, what, how important it is that um, we think about um, demand response programs that can support demand side, um, demand side management and demand side um, response to the energy transition. So the outline of my presentation is, um, I'll start with giving an introduction of the study why it's relevant, what we're thinking about, the objective, the overall objectives and research questions that we we are exploring and how we explore that in these three topics. Looking at optimization, um, looking at um, value focused thinking with respect to community values and energy story decisions, and then how this ties to um, sustainable energy transition as well in developing countries. So in simple terms, what we want to know is what the benefit of storage can be under different ownership configurations and price policy scenarios. We want to be able to probe this under um, how this can be evaluated if other metrics are included in such an optimization model and how these values differ in different contexts. For example, how this would be in a community like Holyoke, Massachusetts versus Lagos, Nigeria. So. Um, that's our outlook for for this work and this work is part of my um forms part of my research at umass supported with the nsf um, research traineeship grant and the growing convergence research which tries to connect both um 
of researchers from different disciplines. So what, when we think about sustainable energy transitions, um, we think about that from the technology perspective, um, policy, different policies proliferating like um, agendas and how, how we are really exploring um, new energy technologies. So as, as political pressure mounts, I will just take us back to what that outline looks like, the objective, the um, topic one, um, and the different topics around um, the community value of energy storage. Um, so when we think about like sustainable energy transitions, we, we think about it from, from um, both an equitable lens and um, a technology lens. And as political pressure mounts, and evidence of climate change um, emergency becomes apparent. You see that most states are aligning their climate action plans with um, the Paris Agreement and they are re reaffirming their commitment to net zero um, by 2050. What this implies is that there's a push to replace on-demand um, dispatchable fossil-based energy sources with variable renewable energy. And you can see that from the first graph that um, the, the amount of um, electricity that is generated in the US from renewable energy is growing. At, I mean, this is not news to anyone who is probably logged onto this um, call at the moment. So to advance this goal and pre prevent like the limited, um, unlim unlimited expansion of um, polluting generation assets such as picker plants, more favorable action needs to be taken from the consumer end than the supply side, because we can't keep exp um, ex expanding supply, supplying generator, generating assets um, there has to be a limit to that. Now, what we need to emphasize is that distributed energy resources on the on the demand side should be made more intelligent to respond to varying um, varying um, greed needs. But what does this mean for either the greed, um, for either end of the greed, both on the supply end and the demand end? most people might be familiar with the dark hub where what i really want to call our attention to is the ramp needs for um electricity between the hours of 4 to 6 pm so there's that peak period when we are not generating as much from renewables um especially solar and the demand just goes up immediately how what can we do in 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 this kind of situation to to support both the grid and consumers to um, continue getting access to electricity. To this effect, they imagine concepts that um, support DR integration, and that's where technologies such as storage can be leveraged to, to provide a stable electricity access. Now, why energy storage? I mean, there, there's definitely many questions around storage and where storage should ideally be um, deployed. Um, there is a school of thought that believes that storage should be, it's best to deploy it at the utility end and um, behind the meter storage may not be as profitable. Um, what would be the rationale for consumers to invest in, in storage? And that's really what our research questions look at. Energy storage systems support the resilience and reliability of electricity networks and can reduce capital investments. Besides providing backup, they, um, they allow consumers to actually participate in demand response programs. So leveraging, um, using arbitrage to get electricity when the prices are really low and um, you can either sell that or use that when prices are um, higher. And that really underpins our research. As our research questions are how can we transfer economic benefits of the energy transition to low income communities using energy storage and one of the things that we want to look at is first we would be estimating the value of cooperatively owned and operated storage what that means is that we're looking we're using an opti optimization model to look at how um the benefits what what would how different would the cost be if I was operating or getting electricity from the grid without using storage versus if I was getting electricity using storage and how different would these costs be if I operated as an individual versus if I was doing this in a cooperative um, network. 
then the next part of that question is we attempt to look at how these community values might interact with energy storage decisions. What that simply means is what values are um, community communities prioritizing? How do individual members of the communities look at their energy storage decisions or energy access decisions in general? And what kind of values um, are predominant in that situation? And then we try to look at this from um, a developed country context using Holyoke, um, Massachusetts as a case study versus Nigeria. So the first part of this work is um, estimating the value of cooperatively owned and operated storage. Why cooperatives, you may ask? Um, well, one of the things with um, energy justice and equity is that communities tend to feel a lack of ownership or a lack of um, decision making or being in included in the process of um, energy policies or energy decision making processes. So empowerment has been like really fundamental to the idea of cooperatives and people get together to achieve goals that they set. And one, it's one of the ways that we can facilitate a bottom up approach to um, development where large corporations are not the predominant players um, in the energy system. Cooperatives also have uh, a way of fostering some intrinsic um, cooperative value. That is a shared vision within members of that cooperative or within members of that collaborative network. And this is something you tend to find in some communities and there are these traits that still exist, but in other sectors of the economy. And this also fosters um, the shared en um, energy economy idea. Um, so in looking at this problem and how um, how we developed our model, we used um, end use load profiles um, from Holyo Gas and Electric that are anonymized and um, coded by census blocks. That is um, daily demand profiles. We also used as input electricity prices that we obtained just for illustrative purposes from um, ISO New England the historical locational marginal prices for Holyoke and then time of use prices from different um, programs. And then our key assumptions are like on the storage size, we assume um, a range of sizes for the storage, the number of aggregated units, um, the initial state of charge, can, the depth of discharge, and we input this into the storage model and develop, um, come up with some results that show that there are some marginal savings and benefits from operating storage, but that, you know, this could then, we could do some sensitivity on um, the different um, time of use prices versus um, real-time pricing. So for the purpose of this presentation, I've used only real-time prices from um, ISO New England. What does our model look like? So this is um, still a basic operation model of a battery. There are no um, chemical like um, constraints on how the battery operates, but basic um, capacity constraints on the battery. We have um, the demand constraints that ensures that there's a balance between what is demanded, what consumers need from the India daily loads versus what the battery can supply. Um, and then the battery cannot discharge beyond its, um, its size, which is also an assumption that we put in the, into the model. And um, we also look at the rate of discharge, which is like the power, um, how much of that is discharged per time. Um, we evaluate the benefit of storage by finding the difference between um, the total cost of electricity without storage and the total cost of electricity to the consumer with storage. And some of our initial results are presented in this slide. We see overall, um, we see overall a benefit from from utilizing um, storage. With in an aggregated form, and this benefit is quantified as a percentage as a new metric, that is the percentage of the benefit from um, from collaboration. In these results, we use um, a cluster of 
households that are like um, about five households in in a cluster and um, with the assumption that these could be co-located in a multiple family housing unit which removes the constraint on um, new physical infrastructure that might be needed to um, ensure connectivity within the units. So we plan to expand this analysis to different configuration sizes and also to do an analysis over a year um, of um, storage and include the, the capital investment for, for storage as well. But it's really interesting, I think, at, like for the first instance to see how the benefits also vary by, um, by the capacity of batteries that might be installed and what the optimal capacity for different configurations might be. So the next question on how uh, marginalized val communities values interact with energy storage decisions. We look at Holyoke, Massachusetts. Holyoke is defined as um, an environmental justice community where more than 75% um, of the population meets the official criteria of an EJ community due to linguistic isolation, low income residents, and um, a high proportion of racial and ethnic minority groups represented in the population. Um, the map to the left shows the gener generic map of Holyoke, and then the map to the right kind of indicates um, the proportion of EJ, um, kind of like the EJ metrics that I that was um, established by Massachusetts, superimposed on the energy body, and you find Holyoke somewhere here, with a high EJ and average economic um, energy body index. Massachusetts is also, I, I want to highlight that Massachusetts in its climate plan has also set um, 2050 as the year it wants to achieve net zero, but with an intermediary policy of 50% um, em emissions reduction by 2030, which implies that they are also pushing a lot of, um, of green policies and um, clean energy policies into um, for the grid. So what also makes Holyoke very interesting to study is that over the past decade, um, Latinx led multi-ethnic environmental justice coalitions have mobilized against pipeline development and transportation pollution. So there's a lot of EJ activity in Holyoke and that makes it a priority for studies around equity and energy access. For our research um, in trying to establish what values or how they interact with um, with energy story decisions, we do a first analysis of like focus. We do a first focus group discussion with three English speaking groups and one Spanish speaking groups, having um, a total of thirty six participants in in trying to access um, in trying to kind of establish what how they interact with their energy systems and how they articulate the energy transition. We ask questions related to their energy use, um, their daily demand. We also try to understand how, how knowledgeable they are about the energy transition, what technologies are for, uh, at the forefront of their decision-making process. Like, uh, do they have um, rooftop solar? What do they think about rooftop solar? And to be able to analyze this data, we use um, um, a coding platform we use deduce using both open coding and focus coding so the results of the open coding kind of lead us to um, a further analysis using like focus coding the initial results from the open coding we see um expressions from um residents about how the how they feel about their energy use and household energy and this was the aftermath of the pandemic is that you know like they they think a lot about their energy allocation or their the allocation of resources or financial resources to their energy use as a game of chess so thinking about how they are penny pinching and likening it to a game of chess and i found this very interesting that it's a strategy game for them like if you if there's one move that goes wrong 
then um, other aspects or other ways that they have other expenditures, household expenditures might be put in jeopardy. So lightning, penny pinching and allocation of the financial resources to a game of chance. A, a game of chess was very interesting for me. Um, so when they conceptualize their energy access um, problems on a community level, they highlight the overall poor housing stock. They also highlight the gas moratorium that is being um, a, a big priority in Holyoke at the moment, and then the limited control and engagement in planning decisions. One interesting thing that really came out of this research was the ambivalence to renewable energy or clean energy policy and technology. Ultimately, people are feeling like they, they don't really have a say, especially when you have um, the landlord versus renters um, problem, where most renters think that landlords are making decisions relative to what is more profitable to them and that the policies don't necessarily favor renters. Um, and then you also find conversations around cost being highlighted as um, the initial cost of startup of a renewable energy technology or, in, or integrating that into their household energy mix is going to be outrageous. So um, you find that there's some ambivalence. It's not necessarily, we, we are not necessarily against um, having renewable energy or having storage but we don't we can't necessarily afford it either and in cases where there are policies that support that it only supports um, homeowners so now taking a deeper dive looking at um doing a focus coding of these um results we used um values from literature that are related to story decisions and cost, reliability, control, and ownership seem to be the more advanced or more documented ones. Um, in doing this, we look at incentives, how do they articulate incentives, how do the residents or the participants in the focus group discussion um, look at payment for services, the tariff design, um, weather-related events, um, outage and blackouts, and then the community ties. One, one thing that was very predominant like that came out of this discuss of this focus group discussion was that reliability wasn't reliability which is um tied um when when people talk about storage um reliability is the first thing that you think about but reliability wasn't really um highlighted in the focus group discussions with the community members however this was highlighted in the expert interviews that we conducted um costs obviously was a, a very big concern. Reducing their energy burden was a big concern to the communities. Um, less money for food, less abundance. Um, they feel that um, people should own their energy. And this kind of was, uh, this was very important for us because when we are thinking about collaboration we, and we think about ownership, if, if there's a, a general consensus or there's a feeling or there's a value for that control and ownership then that furthers or indicates that there's a, there's a high likelihood that such um, a business model can be adopted within the community so the, the we had one participant saying that people should own their energy we're getting energy from the sun from um solar and why should it still be expensive if we do own our own energy then we we don't necessarily have to pay operating costs um, for that source. Um, and then in general, that it helps nobody but the homeowner. Still bringing into context the whole concept of the homeowner versus the renter. So we, we used keywords such as cost, payment, outage, and blackouts to really look at the, the focus group discussions. One thing to highlight here is that these focus group discussions were not centered on on story decisions. The focus group discussions were centered on basic interaction with your energy system. And as a next step, we think that this, like doing focus group discussions and expert interviews that are really focused on story decisions, trying to fine tune what values 
can be quantified in um, and be integrated into the model will be very important for us. So when you look at this um, pseudo objective hierarchy, we find that cost reliability are easier to model. In our, in our model, we've already integrated a metric on cost, but next, and the next thing will be to integrate on reliability, but then how do we model um, controls and ownership is also a priority. How, how can we model that or how can we integrate that? So we use an value, value focused thinking approach to look at um, controls and ownership, and we would be using more of qualitative metrics to, to assess that. How can we, like taking all of these um, research and experiences and tying it back to like the developing country context, like Nigeria. Um, I was walking on the streets, like in one of the, one of the times I was home and just talking to um, micro and small medium enterprise operators, generally just trying to assess what they think about energy, energy access and how um, they interact with the energy systems. And it was very surprising for me to see someone with his leather seat battery um, on a wheelbarrow. I don't know how many people are very familiar with what a wheelbarrow is, but storage is something that they're already familiar with. Or storage is something that they're already making decisions about, particularly um, micro scale enterprises that uh, kind of like the bedrock of the economies in um, in sub-Saharan African context. So this is an image of someone who sells um, phone casings, chargers, a very important business in in Nigeria, using his batteries on the go to test if the chargers work or if whatever he's selling, you know, works. So what we want to do in this context of Nigeria is to look at micro, especially micro and um, small scale enterprises and assess how storage can be of benefit to them. Just for context, 75% um, of the people in Sub-Saharan Africa live without electricity access. Um, Nigeria is one of those places where you experience a lot of blackouts in a year. And it's estimated at 4,600 hours in a year, which is over 50% of, um, of the time in a year. So it's very important to think about storage, not only from a cost perspective, but from a reliability perspective as well. In essence, we will be looking at what these values would be and how different they would be from like Holyoke um, storage decision. And we'll be using a value for cost approach. This is a study by um destiny and um destiny knock and erin baker on value focused thinking in the ghana context and the the idea would be to develop um an objective hierarchy of these values and model them in in an optimization model okay so next steps i've kind of highlighted some of the next steps in the conversation um, design more storage specific questions to elicit the values of um, stakeholders in, in storage decision, De develop an objective hierarchy based on the literature and interviews, and develop quantifiable metrics that we can integrate into our model. Thank you. These are some of the uh, collaborators I've had in, over time in developing this research, and um, I would like to thank you for listening and welcome questions. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Vivian. That was great. Um, we're already receiving some questions, so I will uh, share the first one um, that came in actually from Amanda Graham. And then we have a couple that we received during registration. So modeling qualitative data is indeed hard. Can you say more about how you're approaching that challenge for the collaboration and ownership, and ownership themes in the focus group data? Should I take questions one or like? How would you prefer? Would you prefer to have a couple and respond to them or take them one at a time? I can, I can take them one at a time. Oh. Okay, great. Yes, indeed. Um, um, modeling collaboration and ownership themes are very um, difficult. 
one way we could try to look at that is we could also look at um, the number of community um, initiatives that are present in in that um, locality or the geographical location of interest and integrate that as um, integrate that as a, 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 a variable in in our in our decision in our objective function so we could we could either quantify the number of like initiatives or that are currently present as an indicator of the willingness to collaborate or um to be able to develop something cooperatively on the side of ownership it's really difficult to quantify that because we're not thinking about ownership in terms of like how many people actually own um how many people actually own renewable energy systems or clean energy technologies we're thinking about ownership in terms of how like how inclusive these processes are or how how um sustainable that we can make them so it's really difficult and we we're thinking that a qualitative approach might be more insightful in 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 providing um more information so i think um we could we can ideally model collaboration but ownership schemes and and those two together might be better off just being um, case studies and qualitative insights. Great, that makes a lot of sense. So again, it looks like there's some more questions coming in. Uh, you can submit them through the Q&A icon. Um, I'll, I'll share one from the registration. Uh, this person is curious if the speaker considers non-residential and non-DR cases, such as apartment buildings and resilient backup power, et cetera. Hmm. Um, could you go over the question again? Because it yeah, it's not quite a full question. So if, yeah. if it feels too, if it's an incomplete answer, let me know. Um, and if that person listening could maybe write it again, that might be helpful. But they were curious if you consider non-residential and non-DR cases, such as apartment buildings, I guess domestic residency potentially is what DR means there, such as apartment buildings and resilient backup power. Um, I think we're, we're definitely, maybe also because maybe this, present, this question came in before the presentation, um, apartment buildings are a priority because we want to model like places where you know people can jointly own or share resources um and also because housing stock has been mentioned as um, a concern for for these um, low-income communities so i don't know if i'm getting this right but from my perspective it's definitely a priority to model i include those kind of housing systems in our um in our work um, the other question was on resilience. Community resilience is a value that we hope to find. Like when we talk about like um, reliability and resilience, we looking at um, outages and weather related events. We're hoping that that's something that it exists in the literature, it's been documented. So we're hoping that we can find that as a value also in the communities when we do more um, storage related um, surveys and interviews we're hoping that we see we that 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 is expressed within the communities although as a challenge it on the on the micro level you find that um community members are not necessarily able to art articulate properly what their their storage decisions or their energy access decisions are so it, we are hoping that some elements of like resilience would be expressed in their values yeah that's great um Thank you. I'll share another question from the group. I did just want to say that, you know, echo what you're saying about kind of the importance of including renters in energy justice, energy equity measures. We're studying that in the Upper Valley of Vermont and New Hampshire and finding similarly that a lot of the weatherization and energy efficiency programs are mainly geared toward homeowners. And uh, there's a lot of the most low income residents who really need those services. Um, so the next question is very interesting presentation, Vivian, thank you. This is a generic question. I imagine with research involving qualitative methods, especially for someone from an engineering background, learning and unlearning presents itself in equal measures. Can you say a bit about how your approach has been? What has been your experience so far? 
Um, thank you for that question. I think it's very interesting from an engineering perspective to actually do qualitative research, um, which is something that a lot of engineers that I know like kind of shy away from. You only want to deal with the numbers and you don't want to deal with the context. Um, in some ways, I think that having this qualitative perspective also brings some richness and robustness, if I might say, <laughs> to the modeling. Um, I think um, it's been very interesting to consider things that you might otherwise overlook if you're looking only at data. Um, but having that qualitative insight, such as, you know, like local practices, because something that we did um, while trying to get um, the data from the community in Holyoke is to attend a lot of the community events to also understand how they function as a community, like embedding ourselves within that um, community to, to identify key futures, um, how many, what initiatives do they have? How is the community organized locally? I think that is very interesting for me as an engineer, because if I were just looking at the data from HGNE, I would otherwise not see that. And like my conclusions would be only half um, baked. That's great. Can I ask a follow up question? I'm just curious. I thought it was really fascinating how you shared kind of this comparative research between the Holyoke community and in Massachusetts and then your your work in Nigeria. And I'm curious kind of what are next steps for your research and do you see that you might build upon that comparison in certain ways? Um, so the next steps, because this is still a pre dissertation work. The next steps would be to actually do focus groups and interact with experts in Nigeria. Um, that's planned for um, the end of the year to get an understanding of different market structures. We're looking at micro businesses. So that means that these businesses might not exist within like typical market structures that are in sub-Saharan African um, countries, but they could exist within, um, are embedded even in residences. So we we hope to find some interaction with residential energy demand and like the energy that is required to run and operate a business. For context, like informal, the informal sector makes up more than 50% of um, the economy in Nigeria. So they are the most employers, they take on um, most of, um, you, you start, you, you're engaged in a, um, a micro enterprise very early on so you have multiple people working on in multiple businesses and um i need to verify this but the ratio is that you have more uh, businesses to one person so you could have like 1.7 or so businesses to one person on average so i think that's like very interesting to now see in in more detail what um the energy needs of such a community would be versus um, Holyoke, Massachusetts, where resilience is um, a concern, reliability is a concern, but reliability is not framed in the same way that it is framed in Nigeria. I mean, Holyoke does not experience like blackouts like half of the time of the year. So I, I imagine that storage would, would have a different set of values um, in such a context. And yes, we would we plan to take that forward. That's a really fascinating question. It's uh, kind of the cultural values of storage in different in different places. That's that sounds like very important research going forward. Um, is are there any more questions from the group? I have one that's a bit more generic. I can share it and see if there's any feedback you'd like to give this was another one given before your talk. What are the prospects of high performance computation and artificial intelligence in any re energy resources and engineering? Oh, this is a bit more generic, but I'll tie it a bit more to DR um, because um, you definitely cannot take on such a research or you can't think about demand response or um, time of use pricing, real time pricing, uh, or designing local electricity markets without thinking about like intelligent systems. And I think that is like a nexus that is being explored, especially when you think about flexibility, demand flexibility, and all of that. We need the devices to communicate with one another. We need like um, 
to be able to have that interface for local electricity markets to be able to function. And I think that's, that is the bedrock of um, demand response or, um, or flexibility. Like you can't have that without. So that's, a, that's already a function or whatever it is in engineering for, for AI data um, um, and um, intelligence systems in, in engineering. But there's there so many more applications. And I think just having that perspective from, from an energy lens that, um, yeah, it's, it, there's, we can't move forward without that. So, yeah. Looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, I guess if, if we don't have any more, we could, we could end there unless Vivian would like to share anything else before we, we end the session. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like looking at storage, looking at demand response or time of use pricing, and then thinking about how this can be leveraged for like flexibility. I think it's a very interesting topic and I find it very fascinating how, um, how different states are also advancing these measures. And then you find that some states are prioritizing it more than others. Um, I did a research on, on that recently um, over the summer and um, California is pushing a lot of distributed energy resources and trying to create this local electricity markets where um, where consumers can get um, prize signals to to be able to support their energy decision making and they can basically buy or book ahead um, the energy their energy needs for a week or a month and um, locking that price without having to um, pay more or pay less. And then what happens is that the difference is settled at the end of the day. So I think this is like very, this is frontier research and it still ties back to the work that we're doing. But now we want to see like, is the people being prioritized or the people participating in this system or in such um, an initiative, just the high income communities or are low income communities also privy to this kind of opportunities? Because can they afford the technology that is required to participate in in such a program? Um, are they able to support their own energy needs and actually get the benefits of the energy transition? I think that's like something that, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. critical questions for the future. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience. We look forward to following your work and learning from your PhD research as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for moderating. And thank you so much for joining us today, Vivian, and sharing that great talk. It was really wonderful. And I really enjoyed the discussion. Um, and we hope that you will stay in touch because we will be very interested to hear about how the next phase of your work goes for sure. So thank you again for, for sharing your research with us today. And thank you again to Dr. Sarah Kelly for moderating. Um, we have some more events coming up um, this Wednesday, or next Wednesday, I am sorry, we have um, Faculty Symposium on uh, Climate, Energy, and Society, which will be here on the Dartmouth campus. Um, so you can register for that. And then our new energy series continues on October 26th um, with a talk from Victoria Gravina, um, who will be talking about the cultures of energy efficiency in the Ukraine in times of war. So we hope that you will join us for that. So thank you again to Vivian for joining us and to Sarah for moderating, and we hope to see you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.